Welcome to CT Small Business Toolkit, where small business innovators and influencers share the advice that will help you turn your idea into a business and your business into a success. Let's get started. Our guests this week on CT Small Business Toolkit are Mike and Heather Acera. They're a husband and wife team and the creators of Lux Blocks, a bendable building toy that they make right here in the U.S. in Galesburg, Illinois. They join us today to talk about the idea, how they turn the idea into a business, and what they love most about this. And Mike and Heather, thanks very much for being with us. Thank you. Our pleasure. Well, I read in your materials here, Mike, that it took 25 years of thought and nearly four years of prototype development for the two of you to achieve this particular design. So obviously, this has been a dream for a long time. Explain how it started. It took an embarrassingly long period of time because it started just as learning about uh, the history of a problem, you know. And, I didn't know, and when I was younger, I didn't know it was a problem when I was a little kid working with Lego. I, I just wanted to build things that Lego didn't want to build. And then when I was in college, it, it turned into more of a study of people like Bucky Fuller and, and Frank Lloyd Wright. And when my wife and I started uh, dating, we, we pursued this passion together of learning about Frank Lloyd Wright and Bucky Fuller and how they themselves said their early experiences in kindergarten were some of the big, biggest influences in their lives. So that became very interesting to us. Yes, and when we had children, we were very interested in pedagogy and, you know, how they learn. And so we were uh, very captured by Froebel, who invented kindergarten and the Froebel blocks. Uh, that he used to to work with his students, and those Fruggle blocks were actually the blocks that both Buckminster Fuller and Frank Lloyd Wright credited with in terms of informing their understanding of structure and design as children, which obviously they're great pioneers in that area. So, you know, it was just a few years later where we really said, hey, let's really try to make a better block, you know, something that kids can, can learn through playing about structural principles, and that's when we got serious. We initially started um, designing prototypes and going to plastic manufacturers, and we'd wait a month and, you know, spend $300, get a couple of prototypes, and, gee, they don't work. So it was very unsatisfying approaching it that way, so we went ahead and bought one of the first maker bots, and um, luckily there was a, a young a 15-year-old who had learned through a robotics challenge, CAD design. My husband's an artist, so he would draw different prototypes and give them to Daniel, who would put them in CAD, and then we'd plug them into the MakerBot. And the MakerBot's a 3D printer. Yes, that's a 3D printer. And so that really helped us move up, you know, only took us three and a half years after that to really come up with a We put 4,000 working hours on the printer, made thousands of blocks, had dozens of focus groups. Design went through about maybe 50 to 100 iterations until we had a block that really just did way beyond what we even thought it would do. We even had a physicist from Germany come in and give us his opinion. We didn't actually go with all of his ideas, but but we had lots of input, and I think that's why it's such a such a really high performing block is because gosh, we had friends, family, real kids, and it was very organic. And I don't think most toys actually originate in this way. This, if you go to luxblocks.com, l-u-x-b-l-o-x.com, you can tell that this is a very unique, very different way of doing building blocks. If you're thinking Legos, don't think that because it's a very different shape. It can do so many different things than that. But were there any sort of patent issues uh, just related to building blocks in general that you had to navigate? Or was your product so unique that that wasn't an issue for you? That's a good question because we wouldn't have gone to market if we if it was already out there. Um, we uh, did an exhaustive patent research and now we have patent pendings uh, internationally all over the place. So they're not final, but they're they're in the works, and I, and the, it's, a lot of the patent is focused on that uh, unique snapping and locking hinge. Right. But every part of the block has some utility to it. So if you look at the center, uh, the center hole. Uh, that is really designed to be uh, very democratic in nature because we want to encourage learning through play. So we want kids to use the items that they have around their, their home, such as popsicle sticks, number two pencil straws, to expand the kit in an erector set-like fashion. And so that's why it's designed specifically in that manner. Also, the small holes around the center sort of star opening uh, are gauged to the wires used in robotics platforms. We haven't designed anything, you know, that would be a robot, but um, I think that, you know, we just wanted to create something that, that offered tons of opportunity for yeah. creativity. This is less a creature of the toy industry than of the maker movement. This is a, a maker block. So um, uh, it is a toy. It's still in toy stores, but it's also sold in hobby shops. And it's really a creature of that culture of wanting people to innovate and build and design for themselves. So let's talk about the transition now. You had the idea for many years. You eventually went through the prototypes. You got the product the way you wanted it. How did you turn it into a business? 
Well, we wanted to find the most easy market possible to for entree. And luckily, we were in Illinois. We manufacture in Illinois. And Chicago is the home base of Astra, the American Specialty Toy Retail Association, an association for small retailers of toys, and which was perfect. So I, I threw that. I showed them early prototypes. They encouraged us to keep going. They loved the product, and um, we had and we had also had local retailers in Chicago that helped us with the design of the boxes and everything else. And so we went to the first Astra show June 2015 in Charlotte, North Carolina with prototype. We had prototype boxes, prototype blocks, and um, no, no molds made yet. And we had almost $10,000 in sales in two days. So it was crazy. People just went nuts over our product. And so we went right to get a mold and, and uh, start making our product. Yeah, and the reason why we chose that uh, market is because it's just so logical for a fresh new toy to work with those specialty retailers because obviously they're competing against you know the bigger stores and uh, they need unique products. They're also in a unique position where they can actually demonstrate and sell your toy. And when your toy is new and people don't know about it, uh, this is just a perfect marriage to work with these small boutique and specialty retailers because they're able to show and highlight the benefits, the fact that it's made in the U.S., and so it's mutually beneficial. They're looking for things that aren't carried at Target or Walmart. So talk about where you've gone since then. Obviously, a great start, a great reaction at that show. So how long has it been since then, and what type of growth have you seen since then? Our product made it to market October 1st of 2015. We got in about 250 stores by Christmas. We're looking wow. at about 800 stores this fall because we got picked up by bigger lines like Barnes & Noble, which is an extra 450 stores right there. Um, and a lot of museums picked us up, and, uh, so, and we're now selling at a couple stores in Europe. So yeah, we're growing. We have a kind of slow growth attitude because we're financing this ourselves. So we don't want to. We're not aiming at mass market. We manufacture it here in the United States, so we could we can we can build as we go, um, and we could uh, our turnaround for orders is, is a matter of weeks instead of months when you manufacture in China. So our cash flow issues are pretty good that way, considering we could um, not have to. We don't have to give up a lot of cash for a Chinese order that takes months and months for delivery. Were there any challenges? keeping up with the immediate and rising demand? If you talk to our people at the factory, they, they, they were pulling their hairs out over, um, <laughs> that was a big order, but they got it off. So, yeah, it's a challenge because, you know, with any business, it's always about cash flow. And when we do uh, bigger accounts like a Barnes & Noble, they're, they're going to want maybe, you know, 30 or 60 Longer days. terms. Yeah, they want yeah. terms, right? So you have to balance. It's good to have a good bookkeeper, and we have a great bookkeeper. Him and I are always butting heads because I want to, come out with a new color, he's like, how are you going to pay for that? Or, or you know, and, and so he's always looking at the bottom line saying, you can't afford this, but you can afford that. So bookkeepers are important. And um, so I don't know if I answered your question or not, though. What kind of reaction have you gotten from uh, people across the board? Obviously, they're buying it, so they like it. And I'm guessing some of them are buying more and more of it. But I know you also have a passion for uh, the educational side, uh, for, for young kids, and also those who might have some uh, motor function setbacks and even uh, disabled in some ways. So how valuable has that been for them? What kind of feedback have you gotten there? We've gotten great feedback across across the spectrum. Um, the uh, autistic community has been phenomenal, and I think part of what it really engages some of, some of the folks in that community is the fact that it's got the motion component to it, and uh, that is particularly captivating. We had one case where a, a young boy had never played with any kind of manipulative before, but he saw his uh, sister playing with the toy, and his mother recorded him playing with it, and she was crying because he had never engaged with any physical type of toy other than a flat screen. So we were thrilled with that. I mean, that's part of also our sort of mission is to sort of uh, get kids away from doing everything on the computer and get a, a greater understanding of space and structure by actually playing and manipulating objects. I mean, that's one of the things that engineering schools will say is that Americans are really la lacking in spatial intelligence and literacy. So it helps there. But I tell you, you know, when we were initially bringing this out, uh, we were at different fairs in Chicago, different school events, and, uh, you know, adults are captivated by it. Um, you know, ar adult architects would sit there and play for hours with it. 
different professors that w that we just sent the block to have given us feedback that kind of blew our minds. Some of our uh, professor friends have said, well, you can totally moder model DNA strands or different organic chemistry type of uh, models, but it's definitely, it's unique because of that bend. What was the professor who said about well, the Well, here's, here's the thing. When we, were, when we were looking at Froebel, that 19th century designer, he was a geologist. When he made blocks for kids in the 19th century, he made blocks based on crystals, right? And um, so, but he lived in the 19th century. We said, well, we're going to make a block for kids in the 21st century. Um, what do we know now that Froebel couldn't have known then, right? So we lived in the age of Einstein in the 20th century. Well, what did Einstein do? It's kind of interesting. Einstein couldn't do his theories of relativity with um, the geometry that Froebel was using, the flat, planar, Greek geometry. He couldn't do it. He had to go to what's called hyperbolic geometry. There's three kind of geometry groups. There's concave geometry, convex geometry, and there's flat geometry. He had to go to hyperbolic, which is like concave geometry, to describe how gravity warps space, for instance, right? Well, we know about how space warps. We made a block that warps. So you can do hyperbolic and spherical geometry and flat geometry with our block. So first block you're going to do that with. So people, kids don't know they're doing hyperbolic geometry when they're playing with their block. All they know is that they can make things that are squishy with solid blocks. You can make a sphere out of our blocks that squishes, which you can't do with any other block. So, and that's because it's using the geometries of nature, all of them. So that's the science that went into our block, and it just makes it really super fun. The amount of thought, vision, passion, science, all engineering, all involved here is incredible. We're almost out of time. If folks are interested, they can obviously go to the brick-and-mortar stores where your products are sold. They can go to luxblocks.com. How much does this retail for? A small box of 90 blocks retails for 29 and then the 200, 200 blocks is 69 and the large box is 129 for 450 blocks. And we sell online only a super big pack for teachers and classrooms of 900 blocks for 199 Great deal for teachers. Fantastic. Mike and Heather, congratulations on your success following this dream. Certainly sounds like it's been worth it for both of you. Thank you very much for your time today. It was a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Mike and Heather Acera, the husband and wife team that designed Lux Blocks. That's the bendable building toy. You can find it in many hundreds of stores across the country or at LuxBlocks, L-U-X-B-L-O-X dot com. I'm Greg Corumbus reporting for CT Small Business Toolkit. Thanks for joining us on CT Small Business Toolkit. Be sure to visit our website, ct.walterskluwer.com, and follow at CT Corporation on Twitter. We'll see you next time on CT Small Business Toolkit. <laughs>